Good morning again. I have uh, not been able to do a whole lot of work on this lesson, so I want to let you know early this lesson's not going to be a real uh, humdinger, I don't think. And yet it is going to be something that is going to be extremely important to us all. It is our mission. Our mission. Back uh, when I was taking education courses in college, they had us to do goals and make lesson plans and those kinds of things. And as a college student, and not knowing that those things were exactly where I needed to be, I thought, I don't want to do that. And I didn't spend very much time on those kinds of assignments. I tried to learn something that would, I thought would do more good. And yet when I look back over it after several years of teaching, I thought, my goodness, I missed the keys to everything. A mission is a goal, it is an endeavor, it's what controls the actions that you do and where you go, how you grow or whatever that, you know, what your development as a Christian. And we all need them. We need to have a clear mission of what we're doing in life. Certainly we have one as a Christian. And on your outline, our mission is glorifying Jesus. Everything we do in life must be to His glory. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can change that to do all to His glory. Boy, it's a, it, it is who we are. It's not that I became a Christian in name, but I didn't become a Christian in life or in action. I, it's who I am. It's who you are as Christians. And that changes the whole outlook on everything. So I'm going to give you this morning some ways in which we can do that. Some ways that 99.99% .99 of you are already doing that. That means there's only just a little bit of time that we may not be, okay? So the first one is we've got to make Jesus Lord. We don't mind saying Jesus Christ is Lord. We don't mind saying our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't mind saying those things, but then taking that and making that what it really is. To be Lord means He owns me. And Paul told the Ephesians, He bought us with His own blood. For Him to be Lord means... He is my master. And so when he says for me to go into all the world to preach the gospel, for instance, that's exactly what he means. And he is my master and I need to do it. And when to be Lord means king. And I need to let him reign in my life over me and in me and through me. So the first thing I want you to do is in your mission statement, if you want to put it like that, is to say, today, if I hadn't been before, today I'm making Jesus my Lord. It comes from Philippians chapter 2, verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Two things in that passage that I think is very noteworthy. The first one is that every tongue is going to be made to confess Jesus is Lord. Now just set that over here to the side because that's going to happen at the judgment. I have an option now to confess him, but one day God's going to make everybody do it. The second thing that's noteworthy out there is when you do confess Jesus as Lord, it brings glory to God. Now glory is beauty, it's magnificence, it's excellence, it's lifting God up. It is a worshipful thing for me to say in my life, Jesus is Lord. 
So here's what we do with it. Give him your plans. You know, I plan on doing this, that, or another today or tomorrow or the next day or next week. And James says, we don't need to be saying, I'm going to go into the city and buy and sell and get gain. But what we should say is, if the Lord wills, I will do whatever. And it behooves us as people who are believers, not only in the Bible, but also in God who is in the Bible, in Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Here I am, Lord. Today, I need to do this. And I need you to be with me. And I need you to help me. And I need you to support me. And I need you to make it successful. Give him your plans. And the decisions that you make. Give them to Jesus. He said I will be with you. I won't leave you. And I will help you. you. Need to seek his guidance in all aspects. And that's not just making plans. But when something happens, it's out of the ordinary. And I get surprised by the IRS, for instance. <laughs> or by a sheriff knocking on my door. Or by somebody trying to break in. Or a flat tire. Or whatever happens to me, Lord, help me. Here I am, Lord. I'm yours. Help me. So our prayer today is, Lord, please take care of me. Please, Lord, I, I can't make it without you. Guide me in this lesson for me right now. Give me the words to say. Give me the strength to say it. The energy so that I don't just be monotone all day long. You know. Help me, Lord, in whatever I'm doing. And when you do that, you're going to draw closer to him. Secondly today, our fruits of righteousness. Fruits. <laughs> I pulled John chapter 15 verse 8 says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. And I read that entire chapter trying to find what is it John's talking about here that I will be, I will do if I bear glory if I glorify the Father to bear fruit. And the two things. I'll be what God wants me to be. And I'll have in my heart the compassion and love that God has for me. And I'll be able to share that. So to John, in that position, that's where it is. Glorifying Jesus, I have put down here, is living a life that produces spiritual fruit. I don't know how in the world I can glorify God and not grow spiritually. I don't know how in the world I can glorify God and not bear, in this context here, the fruit he wants me to have. Reflecting him. Jesus shines his light on me. John says, you know, according to Scott's lesson, we walk in the light. That light hits me and it reflects. I, I'm going to give you a funny right here. If I ask you what color is this navy jacket, most of you would say, well, it's blue. Now, Alton Cotton's been in my art class. I don't know whether we did color theory and when you were there, Alton, or not. And I don't know whether you would remember it or not anyway. But, <laughs> but this coat is not blue. What you see is blue. The light that hits it contains all the colors of the spectrum. And the light that is absorbed is what color this suit is. And what is reflected away, which is not what it is, is what you see. It's like a mirror. It reflects back. 
This reflects blue. It absorbs orange. Mm -hmm. This coat's orange. I know that's hard to get in your mind. So when the light of God hits me, some of it I absorb and I grow spiritually by it. But some of it I reflect back and some of it you receive and just maybe you can grow through the light that I reflect. So we need to be an example. That's what you can call it. We need to show these fruits of, the, of God to the world. But here's the thing. We need to seek to show the fruit of God. Brandon had a wonderful class on the first few verses of the book of Acts this morning. And I even learned something I had never even dreamed about down there. Did you know the book of Acts was written by one man? To one man? About one man? I never thought about that, Scott. But the thing that I wanted to say to you about that is that Brandon said, and he's right, and I, I've read this before from commentaries, but he's right. There's no ending to the book of Acts. You read there, and he just stops writing. He just cuts off. And you're wondering, where's the signing off on this letter? Because he said, I write this to you, O Theophilus. It's a letter. But it just quits. In commentaries, people who are supposed to be in the know say that the reason that it, there is no ending to the book of Acts is because God's still active. And he's still doing stuff. And you're writing your chapter of the book of Acts. When Paul goes back to the Antioch church, he reports to them, here is what God does with us. And what you're writing in your account of the last chapter of the book of Acts is what God's doing with you. We need to seek to let others see that fruit. And I've got pulled up there that long list that Paul put in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The very first one is love. So I pulled another verse. John chapter 13, verse 35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Then I thought, wait a minute, Charlie. That, that's what it says. That's what it means. But look at the very first one in the list of the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. It's love. Now what if I take that list and go to John 13, 35 and substitute instead of love, joy. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have joy. Because that's what God gives to us. Or what if I say, by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have peace. And you can go all the way down through the line with that. And all of those characteristics are, are characteristics that we ought to have. And people ought to look at us and because we have those characteristics, they ought to know we belong to Jesus. So I'm going to use that love there in John 13, 35. I believe it was Guy Woods who said, it's a schenectady. And I can't even say it right. I know I didn't pronounce that word right. But it's where a part stands for the whole. And love in John 13, 35, I'm on this morning allowing it to be that long word, which means it's the whole gamut of what God does to you. Next, we've got to live and teach the gospel. Another statement that Brandon made this morning that I just thought was really good. He said, you can't be a Christian 
and keep it a secret. Because either the world will find you out or your Christianity will find the world and change it. But if you keep it a secret, the world is going to overcome you because you're not really reaching out and living it. So I pull Mark 16, 15 because it's a short verse. And he said to them, Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I want you to know something here. You don't have to go to that donkey that's in that pasture right over there next door here and preach the gospel to it. You don't have to catch one of the mice probably that's running back here in, in the back part of the building and preach the gospel to it. But you need to allow your light to so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Whether that's just by the way in which you live, which I think that's exactly what it needs to be done. Or whether it's saying, come here, let me, let me study the Bible with you. Either one of those is perfectly acceptable. On my Thursday night Zoom, uh, there's a boy that's on there named Ryan Simpson. And sometime around March, April, somewhere in that time period, he spent two weeks in Africa. I probably told you this. He baptized 2,800 people in two weeks. Now, there were about six others with him. It wasn't just him. That's right. Well, he just got back a week and a half ago. And guess what he's reporting now? Two weeks, a team of 12 people baptized over 4,000 people. It still works. That's what I'm telling you. The gospel of Jesus Christ is like a two-edged sword and it will divide you apart, get all in you. It will work you over and it will change your life. That's why we need to live it and teach it. Because it is glorifying Jesus it must include this. What we have in Jesus is wonderful. Forgiveness, love, mercy, goodness, hope of heaven. We have God's blessings. Why do we want to keep it to ourselves? Why do we not want to share it with others? It is a great commission. It is a mission. Do you see that? Then they're serving others. And when you're serving others, you're loving. And again, I don't know how you can be a Christian and not reach out to others. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but to love, serve one another. By love, serve one another. If I had to have a reason why I'm being left here on this earth, there it is. Why am I able to enjoy the beauty of the day? Because he left me here. Why did he leave me here? To serve one another in love. That's glorifying Jesus again. And it must involve serving him. And it is again reflecting the love that he's given to us, the light he shed upon us. Then enduring trials with faith. I'm going to have to just read both of these passages and go back through them, I guess. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial 
which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Number one, he told those people, you're fixing to have some trials. He described it as fiery. And I, I don't know what all that means, but I do know this, it isn't good. Now they were going to be persecuted. That's what the context of the passage is. They're going to have their lives taken. And all you got to do is read in Hebrews chapter 11, and you'll find that if you have faith before the world, and they know it, they're coming after you. And why would they not? They came after Jesus, and if you're looking like Jesus, the world is going to try to tear you down. Fiery trial. He says, when that comes upon you, here's how you react. Rejoice. Because that's what they did to Jesus. And you look so much like him that they can't stand you and they're going to do the same thing to you. Rejoice. Because when he comes back, when his glory is revealed, you're going to be so happy. Glad is what King James uses. You're going to be so happy with exceeding joy. Because he's going to tell you, come on in. Because you've been faithful to him. Rejoice. The trials are coming. So glorifying Jesus involves enduring those trials. They're coming to you too. Now we already have some trials. There's some things that make us say, you know, I, I need to do this today rather than worship. Or I need to do this today rather than help somebody. Or I need to do that. And y'all in time, there's something in the back of your mind saying, Charlie, you need to do this or that. You got to endure. You got to go through them. We got to have faith that he's with us in those trials. He's not going to leave us. And we need to pray that our response will be to bring him glory because you do not know how you are going to react when the temptation or the trial comes to you. You do not know that. Therefore, it behooves us to make up our mind before, I am going to try, I'm going to endeavor, I'm going to put my best effort forward to do what God wants me to do in every instance. So let's bring it to a closure. This is not on your outline here. So look up here. We've got to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. We cannot be a Christian without making him our Lord. we got to bear fruits of righteousness. And that means we've got to look like we're making him our Lord. We've got to live and teach the gospel. Or we've got to share the news with this, about this Lord that we've got. We got to serve him by serving others. And if I don't serve others, it's very doubtful I'll be able to serve him at all. We got to put up with whatever comes our way. These things are not a, an extensive list. These are just some things that just popped into this old boy's mind. Okay? Just crazy stuff. But it's needful. It's needful. So if you take this, you now have a mission. And your mission for the rest of your life, every single day you live, is to glorify Jesus. Glorify him. Why? Because he's Lord. Because he's God. It's a mission in which God wants us to have. I know that because I pulled the passages from it. And it's a mission 
which will bring you closer to him and allow you to grow in faith. And I want you to know this. God will help you. Every turn of the way, he will be there and support you. Amen.